So welcome everyone and thank you for uh, joining this uh, ECHO webinar. Um, today we'll talk about the, the PDI data interface and uh, more specifically about uh, data coupling with uh, PDI. Um, this is a work uh, that's been done uh, in collaboration with uh, Carol in uh, Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center. And I am uh, Julien Bigot, a permanent researcher at uh, Maison de la Simulation, CEA, in France. Um, this work is also uh, made possible by a collaboration and the help of many other people uh, that are listed on this, uh, on this slide. So, uh, we want to talk about PDI, but first um, let's uh, introduce the, the motivation uh, that made uh, that was behind PDI when we started this work. Um, the initial motivation was uh, in relation with uh, I/O in uh, high performance computing. When we look at I/O um, input output, we want a lot of things. We want I/O to be easy to use. We want I/O to be performant, fast. We want libraries to be uh, portable so that we can. Uh, move uh, from one computer to another. We want uh, a large support for uh, various languages, programming languages, so that we can, uh, for example, uh, write files uh, from a Fortran application and read them from uh, Python post-processing. Uh, we want a file format that is parallelization independent so that we don't have to care about how many processes we use to write the files. We want the files themselves to be portable so that we can uh, write them on one supercomputer, move them to another and do post-processing somewhere else. We want, well, we want a lot of things. And the thing is that now there is new hardware coming. Uh, we talk a lot about the deep memory hierarchy, uh, adding NVRAM SSDs in between the, the RAM and the disk. And with this new hardware comes new approaches for I.O. Uh, so if we have these intermediate levels, we need to uh, leverage them with asynchronous I.O., with multi-level checkpointing, with in-situ post-processing -pro -post or in-transit post-processing. But that's with today hardware. Uh, the question is, what's next? And well, we don't know. So how to uh, do this uh, complex, uh, to solve this complex problem in code? Well, the thing is, it's a very complex problem. There is no easy solution. And optimizing I.O. is a job on its own. Um, luckily, it's yes, it's a complex, but it's also a common problem. And there is a community with dedicated experts that know how to do uh, I.O. the best way. So. The answer seems quite easy. Let's use libraries. So, IO libraries for HPC. Well, there are a few. Uh, there are many libraries for HPC. I've listed here just a few of them. So, when we move to the uh, library, when we add the library in the equation, uh, the next question that comes to mind is um, how to choose the best library. And it's a problem on its own. Uh, choosing the best library depends on multiple parameters. First, uh, the question is, what is your code? Uh, what, is, what kind of I.O. are you doing in your code? So depending on the code, on its parallelism level, um, on whether it uses uh, replicated on this or distributed data, on, depending on the I.O. frequency, uh, the best library might differ. Um, also, in a single code, there are different reasons why you do I.O. Is it for uh, initializing the data? Is it for uh, writing the results? And are these small or large results? Is it for writing checkpoints, for coupling with uh, another uh, application? Well, depending on all these parameters, the best uh, library might differ also. Then there is the question of the specific execution of your code. Is it a, a small case that you're running for uh, debug purposes, for example, or a large case for production, let's say? Uh, depending on one case or the other, 
the best library might actually differ because the IO pattern will differ. And the last point that is also important to take into account when choosing the, the library is uh, what specific hardware are you using? Um, depending on the IO bandwidth uh, provided by your hardware, by the availability of uh, intermediate storage, depending on many parameters, uh, the best library might not always be the same. So this is a complex problem, but let's take a step, step back and let's look at the, at the view of a simple code. Um, many codes are organized like that. We have some initialization at the beginning. We have then a main loop, typically a time loop, and we have a finalization at the end. And in the in a code like that, um, there are many uh, reasons why we do I/O. As I was saying earlier, uh, at the initialization, you do parameter reading, data initialization. Then inside the type loop, the time loop, you 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 can write intermediate results. You can write checkpoints. You can uh, write uh, data for post-processing, for coupling with uh, other applications. And in that case, you might also have uh, inputs along the execution uh, for coupling, but also for data assimilation, for example. And at the end of your execution, you will uh, write the final results, of course, but also maybe some final checkpoints and whatnot. So all of these uh, different um, reasons for I.O. are similar from the code point of view. You want to export or import data, but the libraries you need are different. And actually, this situation is what we can um, consider a typical code coupling issue, um, except here we're not coupling the code with another code. Uh, we're coupling the code with libraries, and we want to be able to uh, to change the libraries we use from one run to another, or from for one part of the code or another. So we're in a very similar situation to a code coupling issue, except we're coupling with libraries, and this is the approach uh, that is uh, offered by uh, PDI. So. What is the PDI uh, approach? Um, let's talk about um, MPI code. So we have a code with multiple MPI processes. And on the other side, we have some parallel storage. And the question is, what goes in between those two, um, those two things? So the approach taken by PDI is to first standardize a declarative API uh, that is uh, fixed once and for all, and to describe the I.O. not in the code, but in a dedicated YAML file. So the, the description in the I.O. is extracted from the code and is provided from the outside in a dedicated YAML file. Then PDI relies on existing IO libraries through a plugin system to do the actual uh, the actual IO. So when we look at that, uh, something is important to understand. PDI is not an IO library. PDI is actually a modularization uh, library. It implements the dependency injection paradigm. So what is this dependency injection paradigm? Uh, the idea is that your code is not using a library anymore. Instead, you describe in a third party file, the YAML file, what dependencies on external library you want to inject in your code. So your code is no independent of any specific library. This is the goal of PDI. So now let's look at how we uh, plan and how we achieve that. The PDI API is actually pretty simple. Um, there are five main functions. 
the first two functions are uh, really easy. We have a PDI init and PDI finalize. PDI init takes uh, um, the YAML description of actions to do as a parameter. And the PDI finalize function release uh, all uh, resources used by PDI. The two main functions you will use in your code are the PDI share and PDI reclaim functions. So PDI share takes a, a name, a unique identifier, a pointer to the data you want to share, and uh, an access specifier. Uh, called PDI in out. PDI in means that you want uh, information to uh, be provided from the outside to inside your code, while PDI out means that you want to uh, provide information from inside your code to the outside. So um, PDI share will share a buffer. What does it mean? It means that the buffer that we pass as the second parameter will be made available to others once you've made the PDI share call. Um, so what are the others? These are typically the plugins uh, that uh, will do the actual IO for you. So once you've done that, uh, when you say PDI out, the plugins might uh, write the data, or maybe not. And if you say PDI in, the plugins might read data inside your uh, buffer, or they might not. Uh, but you should not use the buffer uh, while the plugins are working. So this is the reason for the PDI reclaim uh, function. Uh, when you say PDI reclaim, you uh, get back the exclusive ownership of the data so uh, that you you give the identifier of your um, of your data and you get back the exclusive ownership so any plugins that was working on your buffer has no stopped uh, the last function pdi event is used to uh, notify pdi that you've reached a given point in your execution it doesn't do anything specific apart from that. So this is the C API, but uh, the uh, similar API is also available in uh, for Fortran or for Python. So in practice, how do you use this PDI share and PDI reclaim functions? Uh, well, this is a very simplified example. Uh, so the idea is that, is that uh, in between a PDI share and a PDI reclaim, uh, you will create a shared region of code in your code um, where your uh, data buffer is referenced in what we call the PDI store. As you put it in the store, uh, that means that the plugins can use the data you've, uh, uh, you've shared in the store. Uh, plugins can use it, so you should refrain from uh, modifying the buffer, of course, because you don't want the plugins to see some uh, half-modified data, and from accessing the content of the buffer in case you uh, shared with the PDI in um, uh, specifier, because some plugin might actually be uh, in the process of modifying the data, and you might end up reading uh, some half uh, modified data. So this is the, the main uh, annotation API of PDI. Uh, PDI shared and PDI reclaim creates these uh, shared regions in the code. And these shared regions put your data uh, in the shared data store. So what exactly is the shared data store? Uh, it is a simple set of references to the buffers that you've uh, shared from your code. Each reference has a unique identifier, a name, a string, character string. It has a, a reference to the buffer, so pointer to the memory you allocated. It doesn't do any copy. And it has a read-write lock so that no two uh, distinct plugins can uh, access the same buffer at the same time. 
it also has information about the type of the buffer. So where do we get this information from? Uh, well, we get that from the YAML file. So the data type of data uh, is uh, provided in the YAML actually for static languages like C, C++ or Fortran. Uh, for uh, dynamic type languages like Python, you don't even need to do that because we can extract the information directly from the language. So this type system is inspired from MPI or HDF5. You have three uh, main types of uh, data. Uh, scalar, uh, that is your uh, simplest type of data. Uh, array and a record that represent uh, a C structure or a Fortran derived type. So for example, here we can see that main buffer, uh, that is the identifier provided in the code, uh, is an array that contains double and its size is provided by a buffer size. So how does it work? Well, PDI handles two kinds of uh, data. On the one hand, we have data, and on the other hand, we have metadata. In the case of data, like buffer, which is the uh, general case, uh, PDI only handles the pointer uh, for data, so uh, it has a minimal overhead because it doesn't do any copy or anything like that. In the case of metadata, uh, PDI will keep a copy. So metadata is intended to be used for a small uh, metadata information, like the buffer size in this case. And uh, metadata can be referenced using dollar expressions. So for example, in this case, the size of the buffer uh, called main buffer is actually provided by the uh, content of something else that is also exposed by the code uh, whose name is buffer size. So the code exposes the buffer size and then from that we get the actual size of the uh, buffer. So if we go back to our uh, data store, this is where the uh, type um, of the data comes from. This data store enables uh, the code and plugins to access and to exchange data. But data is not everything. We also need uh, to be able to pass control. Um, and this is handled by the uh, PDI notification system. Um, this PDI notification system enables the plugins to uh, register to be called uh, in two different kinds of situations. So first, um, when uh, some data is shared or accessed, the plugins can be notified. So for example, when we, you make data available, the plugins can be notified. Or at arbitrary uh, locations in the code that you identified with your uh, named event, the PDI event function we saw uh, earlier. Basically, that's really uh, the core of PDI. So to uh, summarize, the PDI approach is uh, that in your code, well, you start by writing your code as you, uh, as you do uh, usually. Uh, then you annotate uh, the availability of your buffers using this share reclaim um, annotations. So. You, uh, you tell PDI when a buffer is available for I.O. and when it's not anymore. You can then compile your code and you're done on the code side. That's it, you don't have to touch the code anymore. On the other side, in the YAML file, you first have to uh, describe the shared data, at least uh, describe the type of the shared data, and then once you've done that, you can use uh, pre-made plugins or write your own code to choose uh, the IO uh, library to use and describe the behavior you want for IO. So uh, in this uh, YAML file, you will tell the plugins how to react to events and what data to access in the store. 
So how does it um, actually work uh, in practice? Uh, let's have a look at a very simple code again, where we start by sharing the buffer size for a buffer, then uh, allocating the buffer, and we have an iteration main loop where we share the main buffer at each and every iteration. A first things we can do, a first thing we can do is to use um, HDF5, the HDF5 library through the declarative HDF5 uh, PDI plugin. Uh, this PDI uh, lets you write the data uh, manipulated in your code in the HDF5 format. Um, this plugin heavily relies on dollar expressions and default configuration values to make the simple things easy, but the complex things possible. So for example, you might want to uh, write your uh, data, just dump them in an HDF5 file. How does it work? Well, you start by describing the type of your data, of course, then you load the DEC HDF5 plugin and you configure it. And you just have to say in what file you want to write your data and what data you want to write. And this is enough. Just the main buffer is the identifier of your uh, data from your code. And the file name, name uses this dollar expression to get one file per process and per iteration. And that's it. With that, you will get an HDF5 file with uh, a single data set called main buffer containing the content of your main buffer with the exact same size as it was in the code. This is the most simple way you can do it. But you can also do much more complex things, like, for example, uh, writing a selection of the data in parallel and rearranging the uh, data uh, to go from a 1D buffer in the code to a 2D buffer in the file uh, using the time as the second dimension and excluding potential uh, ghost zones and joining the data from all processes in a single process. So I will not uh, describe in details this file. I've done that in many uh, previous uh, presentations. You can see, for example, the presentation from two years ago on the YouTube channel of the Eco project. But this is uh, something that is made possible by PDI. So to move from a very simple use of HDF5 to something uh, quite complex. So using PDI for IO, you just have to annotate your code and then you can choose your library and the configuration of the library you want to use, uh, the actual behavior, IO behavior, um, without having to recompile your code, just modifying the YAML file that is loaded at uh, execution. So what do we support right now? We support HDF5, parallel HDF5. Uh, CyanLib support has been uh, implemented in the framework of ECO. Uh, FTI support also in the framework of uh, ECO. Uh, there is a work in progress to support the NetCDF library. And actually, it's pretty easy and pretty simple to add your own library. So for example, um, people at NEA recently developed a POSIX plugin uh, for a specific use case um, for PDI. In ECO, uh, this approach uh, is used to separate the work on the actual code. Uh, that is done in work package one and two, and the IO optimization work that we do in, uh, in work package four. So uh, PDI uh, provides an interface that makes it easy to uh, work to separate concerns and to work independently on those two aspects in the code. So that was for the coupling with IO, um, but coupling uh, with the IO, um, 
uh, how does that work behind the scene? When we look at our code uh, that we had uh, earlier, our example code, um, we can see so our initialization, main loop, finalization, and writing at each uh, iteration. Behind the scene, what we do with PDI is first that we uh, remove the uh, actual writing of data in, uh, in the, from the code. Instead, we provide the data references to, uh, we store them in the PDI store at each iteration. We then uh, load the uh, declarative HDF5 plugin from the YAML file. And this plugin will receive the events uh, notification every time the data is exposed. When this happens, the plugin will go get the data reference from the store and write it to disk. So this is what happens for the um, HDF5 case I've described earlier. But we can go be, uh, beyond that um, with data coupling. So if we go back to our initial example, uh, we've seen that there are many reasons why we want, might want to do um, IO. And the approach we advocate in uh, PDI is to uh, say that all these different parts of the code um, actually uh, have different issues and uh, they should be uh, separated. So uh, the approach we advocate is to separate these concerns in separate modules and have uh, independent codes for each part of your uh, simulation. Once we have this set of independent modules, we can now use uh, PDI to couple these modules. So uh, we uh, can store the reference for reading, but also for writing in the store. Uh, we can describe in the, um, in the YAML file the loading of multiple plugins that will each receive the uh, data reference and the events. Uh, and then we can uh, connect those plugins uh, so that they do the actual call of the initialization, finalization, and the actual I.O. Uh, with your code. This enables you to uh, separate all this part of your, uh, of your code in completely independent uh, modules and to uh, simplify their replacement. But it also makes it possible to add new uh, modules to your code very easily. And for example, if you want to move to uh, in-situ post-processing, um, you can uh, move to a call of the post-processing reading the files from disk to a call directly in the code very easily using this approach. So when we uh, say we want to do a uh, data coupling with PDI, uh, one example of plugin that supports that is what we call the PyCall uh, plugin. The PyCall plugin lets you call your own Python code when um, data is exposed by your main code. Uh, data is then made available to your Python code as NumPy arrays. And here, for example, you can see in the YAML file, we specify an actual bit of code in Python that we want to um, execute whenever um, an event is triggered. This data you can modify in the Python code, you can generate new data, you can actually do post-processing in process and transform the data to expose it again, to share it again to PDI to actually write the result. So with this approach, uh, calling a Python function you already have for post-processing is made really uh, easy. Uh, you can do it in situ in the process of your simulation code in just three lines in your uh, YAML file. Another plugin we support 
is called the user code plugin. It's very similar to the PyCall plugin, but it supports C and Fortran functions instead of Python for functions. Uh, this is interesting when performance matters and that uh, Python doesn't provide the expected performance. But this is also useful to call um, actual uh, I.O. libraries for which uh, PDI doesn't provide any uh, dedicated plugin. In that case, you just have to specify in the YAML the name of the function you want to call, uh, the list of parameters you want to uh, provide the function, and you can write your function. It will be automatically called by PDI in the process of your simulation. So these were two examples for uh, data coupling with PDI. Um, you can call your own function in process using user code or PyCall, but you can also include your code in a workflow. And for that, we have a plugin uh, with the Flover, Flovior library developed uh, at uh, Inria uh, that has been my uh, that has been developed in uh, Poznan Supercomputing uh, Center. Um, there is also a work in progress to uh, integrate um, your application in an ensemble run using Melissa, also developed uh, at INRIA. Uh, this is developed uh, in the framework of uh, ECO2 um, in the work package uh, four and five um, interaction. And a last work in progress is to couple uh, your code with a data analysis framework, uh, such as Desk, a Python framework. And this is developed at uh, Maison de la Simulation by uh, Karim Masnawi and Sampis Nolfak. So this was the presentation of PDI. Now I will uh, just very quickly show uh, some preliminary performance evaluation and evaluation of uh, this approach. Uh, this evaluation is now quite old and we're actually uh, making a new evaluation. So that uh, shows the, 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 the result with the latest uh, PDI version, but still uh, it should not differ very much. So in this case, we used the Gisela code, which is uh, plasma physics uh, simulation code for uh, nuclear fusion. Uh, this is a code uh, developed in, uh, that is a part of the uh, ECO project. And we have implemented in the code three way to do checkpointing. One is to not do any checkpoint at all. This is our baseline. And we have uh, checkpointing using HDF5 or FTI. Uh, the FTI dedicated uh, checkpointing library developed in uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which is also part of the ECO project. And finally, we've also implemented checkpointing using uh, PDI. And through PDI, we can use either no checkpointing at all, of course, mm -hmm. HDF5 checkpointing, FTI checkpointing, or we can actually combine FTI and HDF5 checkpointing. Um, first, let's look at the uh, cost of implementing this uh, checkpointing. So here, for example, when uh, implementing checkpointing using HDF5, we have to use uh, 24 uh, distinct functions uh, for about 500 lines of code when using the native HDF5 API. Actually, this is not completely true. It would be a bit more complex to do in reality because this uses some already um, uh, simplified functions uh, that are part of the Gisela uh, HDF5 wrapper. Um, on the other hand, we can use PDI. And in PDI, we just need three different functions and 127 lines of code in, in, um, in Gisela to implement a uh, check. However, we need to do more than that. Uh, we also need to provide the uh, YAML, uh, the YAML configuration file. And this is 100 more uh, lines of code. So 
overall, this is a bit simpler than HDF5, but not that much. Then we also implement uh, FTI, FTI checkpointing. So FTI checkpointing uh, requires the use of seven distinct functions and 216 lines of code. FTI uses a declarative API, so this is simpler than HDF5 and close to PDI, uh, but it also relies on a configuration file in that case. So that's 20 line of, uh, 29 lines of configuration. What's interesting is that when we uh, use the PDI approach, we only have to add seven lines of code in GZLA oh, to uh, expose yeah. that, that was not useful in the case yeah. of the uh, no, and seven yeah. lines yeah. Yeah. configuration yeah. to uh, to support uh, this yeah. approach. So once one approach has been implemented, okay. the next one is really easy. And actually, we've done the same thing uh, by combining HDF5 and FTI for uh, oh. checkpointing. And we can see it's really easy using uh, PDI. And we didn't oh. do the work using um, uh, the native API because it would have been a bit too uh, complex to implement. So this is from an implementation oh, first point of view. Okay. Then the next question is the performance question. We have uh, evaluated the, the performance on the Marinostrum uh, supercomputer uh, in Spain and we compare um, the execution time and we, uh, with and without okay, so uh, in that sì, case, uh, uh, ciao, ciao, ciao. Nodes, we use four distinct nodes, but we uh, scale the size of the problem for, from a very small problem to a large uh, problem. <coughs> and we see um, here the um, execution time by megabyte of uh, data. What we can see is that for each case, so for example, if we look at the FTI case, we have uh, the case with um, the native API with the rounded uh, point and the ca case using the PDI uh, interface with the cross uh, point. And we can see that the two uh, red lines are actually uh, overlapping. This is really showing that the uh, overhead of PDI is uh, negligible in a real case uh, execution, even at the small scale that is the uh, most difficult for a library like PDI. Then uh, we do uh, a weak scaling on the Curie supercomputer, that was a supercomputer at, uh, in France. And once again, we compare with and without uh, PDI. We have a checkpointed data of about uh, 2.1 gigabyte per node. And here uh, we can see a scaling from four nodes to 128 nodes. Um, the first thing to see is that once again, uh, whether we use uh, FTI, HDF5, or uh, nothing at all, the um, version with PDI or without PDI are very similar in terms of performance. The other thing that is interesting to see is that depending on the scale of the experiment, uh, the best library is not always the same. So the best library to use uh, changes from 64 nodes to 128. And what's interesting with PDI is that it's very easy to switch from uh, one library to the, to the other uh, just changing the YAML file, you don't have to change anything in your uh, code to uh, get the most performant uh, option. The final uh, evaluation is regarding the uh, memory usage uh, with and without PDI. 
the three um, uh, graphs represent uh, the three uh, case that have been implemented, no checkpointing, HDF5 checkpointing or FTI checkpointing. And in all three cases, uh, we uh, measure the memory consumption along a very short uh, execution, and we count actually uh, the number of uh, instructions. So the sampling rate means that there is a bit of noise, but what we can see is that um, a PDI doesn't incur any uh, memory overhead. And this is expected because, uh, well, PDI doesn't do any data copy, it just manipulates uh, pointers. So, one last thing I wanted to say about uh, PDI is that uh, in practice, PDI is a library that is publicly available. It's uh, a free and open source library available under a PSD3 closed license. The uh, last release, uh, 0.6.1, has been freshly released, and there are um, many plugins you can uh, that are available in this uh, release: user code, MPI, declarative HDF5, declarative Cyan, FTI, Michael, Flower, and um, other plugins uh, that are not listed here. The documentation is available online. And we've uh, provided a very easy to install, all inclusive distribution. What we mean by that is that you uh, just download that and you will download all the dependencies together with uh, PDI. So you don't have to separately download the FTI, Signlib, or uh, anything else. We have recently uh, made packages for Debian, Ubuntu, CentOS, and Fedora. And there is a, a work in progress to implement the support for SPAC and make it easier um, also. So we're really trying to make the uh, library easy to install for everyone. Uh, there is a training to be announced shortly in the framework of the price trainings, uh, training that will also include other libraries like HDF5, but also Signlib and FTI that are developed in the framework of the ECO project. Yeah. Um, PDI has a Slack channel, so please join us if you're interested in the development or if you want to use the library, uh, you can get support uh, on the PDI Slack channel. To conclude, uh, I've presented the PDI data interface that supports uh, application modularization through uh, an annotation approach, where you just annotate the buffers in your code, and that makes it possible to use dedicated I.O. plugins for HDF5, Signlib, and there are more like NetCDF to come. But it doesn't support I.O. only, it also supports other things fault tolerance with the dedicated fault tolerance interface, bus processing, coupling with the PyCall, user code, and Flowware plugin, for example. It is at the core of the interaction between uh, Work Package 1 and 2 and Work Package 4 in the uh, ECO project. And we have made a huge effort to, uh, effort to make uh, uh, the library easy to use, easy to install. The development is user-driven. Uh, we try to uh, answer you the needs of the uh, library users. So if you want something specific, if you have a specific need, please feel free to, uh, to bring your needs and we'll do our best to implement whatever you need. So thank you for uh, listening to me and I'm now available to uh, answer questions. So I will try to uh, use the question system. If anyone has a question, please uh, raise your hand using the raise hand button. Well, I guess there are no questions. 
So if you have any question, you can always uh, join the Slack channel. Uh, you can uh, find the address of the Slack channel uh, here, but also uh, it's available when you click on this link, you will get all the information on how to contact the uh, PDI development team. So thank you everyone and uh, well, goodbye. I think there is an, an, an announcement for the next uh, webinar, so I will uh, give the microphone to Julien Tello. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining this webinar. Just uh, two quick points of order. The first thing is that uh, you will receive the slides that have been used today and the full video uh, of the webinar will be made available both on the yes, Eco yeah. Project uh, YouTube channel and on the Eco official website. Uh, and the other thing is that we will be having two other webinars. The first one will be a useful complement to this one, given that it's one on the FTI, so the Fault Tolerance Interface, which will be given by Leonardo Bautista Gomez and Kai Keller from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center on April 1st. And the next webinar after this one will be given by Herbert Owen from BSC as well. And this one will be on large eddy simulation. Uh, and wind flow modeling. You'll get all this information sent via email and other information can be found on the ECO website and on the ECO project LinkedIn uh, page as well. Thank you again uh, and I hope you'll be joining us for future classes and webinars. Goodbye everyone.